Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Um, we're a little light this morning. Bruce is not feeling good, so we'll be doing videos later. So for those of you that are watching online, I already have the worship list set up from the uh, music that Mark has picked for today. So we'll post those before the end of the service so you can worship with us at that time. Um, coming up tomorrow, or Wednesday night, we've got another evening of... Uh, coming together and just worshiping and praying together at 7 o'clock. And it seems like this is so far out, but it's only just a few weeks. And here coming up on July 10th, we'll have racing in the morning. And then as soon as we tear down that, we'll bring in the movie crew and we'll put up that 12-foot screen. If you haven't seen it, go check out some of the pictures on Facebook and, and that. This thing will fill up the space from that wall to about here. And the brownie bites and hot dogs and drinks and it's all no charge. So we'll be uh, looking forward to having you all join us for that. Any other announcements I'm missing? Alright. Well, there is one other well, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Can't forget tomorrow. Tomorrow evening. Uh, and this is at 6 so, six, six o'clock out of Kirkwood, Pastor Mark and I will be participating in the uh, flag retirement ceremony, uh, which is the kickoff for the Freedom Fest. And this year's Freedom Fest, thank you Lord, will be in person. There will probably be some modifications that are going along with that, but back to in person celebrating uh, the birth of our country, and we'll do that like I said, starting with the flag retirement ceremony. That will include, as they're uh, retiring those flags, Mark and I will be reading off the names of veterans who have died, or service people who have died over this past year. So it's a, it's a wonderful event to take care of those flags and retire them properly, but we also will be recognizing those who gave off. The only other thing announcement I can think of is when we get done, when we're done worshiping, we're done singing, go out and enjoy this day. Because there's a sign over here, y'all online can't see this, but it says, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So go out and enjoy the day. As we get started this morning, our call to worship is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And in this, Jesus says to us, seek the kingdom of God above all else and then righteously and he will give you everything you need now don't misunderstand that he says everything you need not want need now yesterday Diane and I were uh, out and about and uh, news notification popped up on her phone and said uh, Michigan man who had won $2 million lottery back in 2010 was found dead. He won $2 million. And then he blew it on a house, a car, and fireworks, and the fine for shooting off the fireworks illegally. $2 million. He had more than he needed. He, I, I don't know if I could want to deal with that kind of money. The Lord is good to me. He gives me what I need. I have a roof over my head. I have food on the table. I have a warm place to sleep in the winter and a cool place to sleep in the summer. Thank you, Lord, for that. I have my church family. Thank you, Lord, for that. I have my family. Thank you, Lord, for that. We need to be in a right relationship with Him and make Him our priority. So as we listen to the message that Mark is going to be bringing to us this morning, life e ends, eternity where? Let that sink in as you prepare to hear the message today. 
Father God, as we prepare to hear this message this morning, this message about life and eternity, where, where are we choosing to spend our eternity? Because, Lord, we have to remember that our time here is finite. It will end. But eternity, what happens after that? There's two choices, Father. It is our prayer that people would choose you. Father, be with Pastor Mark as he brings the message this morning. Let us hear the words that you have given to him and the thoughts that you have given to him and the lessons that you have given to him to deliver to us, to, to bring to us this morning, Father. And Father, I know that he has been uh, having a migraine this morning, Father. We release him of that, Father. And we claim that in your mighty name, Father. And we claim this message in your mighty name, Father, that it would resonate with us, we would hear it, and we would go out and live it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, Pastor Perry. So, bear with me today if I'm not super lively, but kind of hype that thing is kind of overwhelming at times. So, uh, but as I was doing my message a week ago, and, and uh, we were talking about different things on, we had our study on Wednesday, and we were kind of talking about that. And Shannon says, you know, Mark has this saying that he that he says all the time, and and she says, I got to thinking about it, and so I said, well, you know, uh, this last week's been kind of a week full of challenges and kind of crazy at times, so I I had this really great message prepared for Father's Day uh, for today and Father's Day next week. So uh, I found out on Friday that I looked at the wrong date on the calendar. So uh, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna prepare a different message today. And so I, I actually, I just sat down and I prayed about it and God says, you need to talk about this. And so you've heard me say it quite often, but life ends eternity where? And it's, it's something that is a truth I mean, none of us last forever, period. I mean, our time on earth is finite. And so we have to make the best of what we have. And so uh, as we talk about these kind of things, there are certain things we need to kind of focus our lives on and, and some of the things we need to refocus our lives on as we go through. So life ends eternity to where? And there's an old saying that you're never too old to learn. And there's one lesson that you should never be too old to learn. And it comes from Psalms 90, 12, and it says, so teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Or as we go through life, we should gain or grow in wisdom as we go through. So we should be learning our entire lives. It isn't a process that just simply stops when we're no longer kids and going to school, but you learn as you go through life. But it's how we learn and what we learn and what we retain that makes the big difference. Now what this means is, is it means that to teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are and help us to spend them as we should. So don't spend them foolishly. So as we grow in wisdom, we understand what it is to live wisely and to spend our time as we should. So last week I asked you guys, how well be a Christian? In other words, what do you make the focus of your life? And I had a lot to say about this, and so I thought I'd kind of expound on some of that as well today. So someone had observed at one point in time that life is like a dollar bill. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. Now I want that to sink in. Life's like a dollar bill. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. Now when you spend your money, there's only one of two ways that you can really do it. You can waste it, or you can invest it properly, spend it properly. And the same is true with life, you know. We can spend it wisely, or we can spend it foolishly. Now whether you're old, whether you're 6 or 65 and well, healthy and wealthy or puny and poor, you can make the rest of your life, the best of your life, 
But the choice is up to you. How you want to spend the rest of your life is all predicated on the choices that you make as you're living out your life. And that's really, really important for you. It doesn't matter when you want to start the process, but that you need to take that first step towards spending the rest of your life and making it the best player of your life. You don't have to settle for where you're at right now. You can make a change and live. See, God wants us to live a fulfilled life. And if you're not doing that, and you're having your past hold you back, or you're having stuff and things of the day and distractions control your life and focus your life, then you're not living that fulfilled life that God wants. So let's suppose we're starting life over as an adult. But you knew then what you know now. What changes would you make and could you make? So you'd be old enough to know right from wrong. Right? Hopefully. <laughs> you'd be old enough to learn, old enough to love, and old enough to really live your life. So if you could ask our Lord Jesus Christ how how to make the rest of your life the best of your life, what do you think he would say? What do you think he'd tell you? See, and we really don't have to wonder about that because I think I already know. I think I found the answer in our call to worship today. It said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. And, and Pastor Terry stole a little bit of my thunder today, which is really cool. Because he said exactly what I wanted to say. Which is, a lot of times, we want all this stuff. And we make the stuff the focus of our life. But it's not really what we need to live our life. It's just the stuff that we make the focus. So I think you can summarize what Jesus said in these three words. First things first. First things first. Now I know that sounds pretty simple, but I want to tell you why I said that. If you would start at the very beginning today, if you would consciously, continuously, constantly, and consistently put first things first, it would absolutely transform your life. So what do I mean about that? Well, the formula for how to do that is found in that passage of scripture right there. We're given many instructions in the scripture in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but listen to this passage from Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. But not the wicked. They're like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment, and sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So it's pretty clear, isn't it? God has a path for us as believers, and he watches over that path. In other words, he's guiding our steps. He's guiding that path to the future. If we put first things first, and we put God first in our life, and we turn that over to him, he's going to lead us where we need to go and what we need to do. And he goes on to say that, our leaves will never wither. We're not going to just kind of dry up and fall away. But that we will prosper in what we do. And God has ordained that. Alan Carr writes about that. And this is a plan that God has got all laid out for us. And it's right here in the scriptures. And it says this. First, we need to set proper priorities. And last week I talked about that we had to have the right priorities in life. Everything succeeds or fails right here. Right here. 
If your priorities aren't in order, then your life won't be in order. If your priorities are not right, then you won't be right. So if you set your priorities on the wrong things, you're going to go down that wrong path. And that's what he was talking about, of the, the, the wicked. They're like, they're like worthless chaff scattered in the wind. And their path leads to destruction. So we need to set our priorities in the right place first. In other words, the focus of our life. You don't have to pray about what your number one priority in life ought to be. You don't have to sit down and really think about it. You, you don't have to sit down and discuss what it might be. You don't have to go and look for it. You just have to do it. You have to do it. Because Jesus already told us what our first priority ought to be. Seek first the kingdom of God. And the word seek here is to actively pursue or, or go after that. And when we really want something in life, what do you do? You make it your mission in life, right? You make it your mission and you're going to go after that thing. You're going to seek it out. And it's in the present tense as it's, it's talking about in here. So it says that we're going to go out and seek. We're going to make that our priority in life. We're going to go out and get it. So seek first that kingdom of God. And it means continuously. We have to do this continuously. It's not a one-time thing. It's just like prayer. You don't, you don't say prayer once. You say prayer every day. And the scriptures tell us to pray constantly. And we have to seek the kingdom of God first constantly, consistently in our lives. So every day of your life, you ought to seek first the kingdom of God. But what does that truly mean? mean to you. You know, it's one thing to read the scriptures, but if they don't make any sense, if they don't click, you can't put them into practice. So in order to seek the kingdom, you must first seek the king, because you can't have a kingdom without a king, right? There, there's no kingdom without a king. So we have to first seek the king. Our first priority in life ought to be to seek the king of the kingdom. So Carr goes on to pose a question. Did you know that the Christian life is more than just accepting the Lord? It's seeking the Lord. The Lord is not just someone you passively accept. He is someone you actively seek. I can tell you something about your relationship to God at this very moment without even knowing you. I can tell how much of God you have. How much of God you have. You have all the God that you want. You have all the God that you want. I want that to really seek in because that talks about exactly what this whole message is about. Life ends eternity where? If you're not actively seeking out God and if you don't have God in your life, then you don't want God. God has to be that first priority, first things first. Seek first the kingdom of God. So on Wednesday night a week ago, Shannon was talking about how she turns to the book of James for direction. And I agree. You need to read that book of James often. You know, I, I was preparing for the message and I read the entire book. Okay, it's only five chapters. So it's a pretty easy read. It's a pretty quick read. But boy, I'll tell you what, it's full of great instruction. It's full of uh, great advice. Uh, James 1, 16 through 18, it said, Don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down from us, from God the Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts the shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. And then later on in James, I read this, <laughs> in James 4, 8, which is like two pages away. It says, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. And that circles right back to what we had just gone over. I can tell how much of God you have. It's how much of God you want. So, draw close to God. 
it was amazing because as I was going through this, these verses would just kind of leap out at me. And it was the answers to what I had just got done writing probably 15, 20 minutes before. We have a good God. So God has promised in his word, and you shall seek me and find me, and when you search with me with all of your heart, in Jeremiah 29, 13. But see, it's not enough to just seek the Lord. We've got to seek him first. And Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. And first, things first mean putting Jesus first in our life. Not down the list. Golf can't be up here. Jesus has to be up here. Jesus wants the first moments of our every day. Jesus wants the first day of every week. Jesus wants to be the first part of our paycheck. He wants to be first in our life. The Lord Jesus Christ is not interested in being first runner-up for your life. He's not interested in being the vice president of the corporation. He's not interested in being second in command of our army. He wants to be the king on the throne of your heart. Not a cohabitant in a duplex. He wants to be the king on the throne of your heart. Meaning, our heart is our holy of holies, and we've talked about that many times before. And if we put Christ in there as the king of our heart, then he becomes the center of our life. And as we center our life in Jesus, and we make him first, first things first, that we will actively be seeking the kingdom of God first in our lives. See, we have to do our part to fulfill the scriptures. If we look in the scriptures in here and we, we look at Jesus' life, he, his whole life fulfilled what was predicated before him by the prophets. And his life fulfilled the scriptures as he lived it out. And this whole year, this past year, throughout the whole pandemic and the derecho and everything that we've, we've talked about, everything we've gone through in the last year, we've been talking about this, that we have to live out our faith, and this is what it means. This is exactly what it means. Not only do we seek the king, we ought to seek the kingdom, and the kingdom of God ought to be the obsession of your life, obsessively consistently, constantly, the first in our life that we see. The word kingdom literally means to rule or reign. A kingdom is a place where the king rules. To seek the kingdom of God is to seek the rule and reign of God over our entire life. Seek that kingdom, seek that reign of God over our entire life. Matthew 6, 33 goes on to tell us, not only are we to seek his kingdom, we are to seek his righteousness. His righteousness. We have to watch all of the things as they're written in the scriptures. His righteousness, not ours. His righteousness. That is, not only are we to be seeking God's control over us, but we are also to be seeking God's character within us. We're all to seek out and foster a right relationship with God. And that's what righteousness is all about, is that right relationship with God. If we don't have a relationship with God, it goes back to what I just got done saying. How much of God do you have in your life? It all comes down to how much of God you want. If we don't have that right relationship with God, we are not seeking His righteousness. His righteousness. The kingdom of God is not only to be inwardly experienced by us, but it's to be outwardly expressed. You see, if God is ruling over you, then his righteousness will be within you. His righteousness will be within you. If you remember from a previous sermon, I stated that a person's character is simply the outward expression of of whatever is controlling them inwardly. And I choose to wear this cross 
The example I made that day was I wear this cross as an outward symbol of my inner commitment. This is to tell people without a doubt when they look at me, I serve Christ. I serve a risen Christ. The cross is empty. But I serve a risen Christ. I'm not ashamed to let people know that. I'm happy to let them know that. And that's talking about being outwardly expressed. If God is really over you, then his righteousness will be within you. And we will show it out to other people. So, just as your faith is shown in your actions, your faith is always seen by its fruit. Character is always seen by its conduct. You see, as we seek the kingdom of God, people ought to be able to see the kingdom in us. And if we have a little faith, we will bear a little fruit. We have a little faith, we'll bear a little fruit. We're never going to make a difference in the world until the world sees the differences in us. How do we change the world one person at a time? How do we do that? They have to look on us and they have to see us as being godly, as being a Christian. If they don't see Christ in us, what good is it? They'll never see that Christian. Friedrich Nietzsche was a German philosopher. He was a philosophical founder of the Nazi movement in Germany. And he was the first man in history to come up with the conclusion that God is dead. That God is dead. And he came to that conclusion by looking at Christianity itself. Do you know what he said about Christians at that point in time? See, he said, if you want to be to believe in your Redeemer, you're going to have to look a little bit more redeemed. If you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you're going to have to look, look a little bit more redeemed. And he's absolutely spot on. I don't care for the man, I don't care for his philosophies, I don't care for anything else, but i got to tell you, that's absolutely true. And that's exactly what I just got done telling you. If we seek the kingdom of God, people ought to be able to see the kingdom in us. In us. Carr states, the real mark of a Christian is that he makes it easier for others to believe in God. Now, what does it mean to seek the righteousness of God? Well, I've got several points. First, we must desire it. And if you want to take notes, there's sermon notes over there. Pads, pens, hints. Uh, what we do is what we really want to do, and what we are is really what we want to be. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So if you feel like you're going through life and you're just kind of going through the motions and your life is not really filled and you're not really living out a fulfilled life at that point in time, you got to ask yourself, are you hungry and thirsting after righteousness, that right relationship with God? Because see, those people will be filled. Their lives will be ordered first thing first. <coughs> You should desire to be right, you should do, desire to do right, and you should desire to live right. Just as much as a hungry person desires food, and a thirsty person desires water. Number two, we must derive it. If we are to seek his righteousness, God is not interested in your righteousness. He's only interested in his righteousness. God's not interested in what you can do for him. He's interested in what you can do through him. There's a big difference in that point. Going through the motions of doing good works isn't going to get us to heaven. It's not going to get us into that eternal life. He's not, he's not caring about what you can do for him. He cares about what he can do through you, through you, for others. Point number three is, we must depict it. 
We ought to live like kingdom subjects. Will Rogers said, we ought to live in such a way that we won't be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. And I can't think of anything better than that. That, that should be a script, right? I'm thinking it should be a script. Okay? We ought to live life in such a way that we should not be and would not be ashamed to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. Our words and actions should reflect our faith and our faithfulness. Our words and our actions. And we, we had an illustration last Wednesday with the toothpaste coming out of the tube on the plate. Okay? And it's like words that come out of our mouth. And if we don't want those words coming out of our mouth, then don't let them come out of our mouth. Because once that toothpaste is out of the tube, it's really, really tough to get it back in that tube. And there was an illustration that I had when we were going through uh, school back there, and I thought it was great because uh, we had a, an elderly uh, pastor who was one of our teachers from the Dubuque Theological Seminary, and, and uh, Elmer came up with this great illustration about a rabbi, and the rabbi took a feather, feather pillow, and he opened up the feather pillow, and they were standing out in the middle of the town, and he says, okay, kids, go out here and let the feathers go. He says, now the feathers represent all the words that you let go out of your mouth. And the feathers, of course, were blown all over the place in the wind. They were all over town and it scattered like crazy, really fast. And he says, okay, now, your words are like those feathers. If you didn't want them to come out of your mouth, how are you going to put them back in? Now go collect every one of those feathers and put them back in the pillow where they started. And they said, well, we can't do that. Yes, exactly. Or actually, I think it was ha was the term that, I, that was used. But that's exactly right. Our words and actions should reflect our faith and our faithfulness. It should be a reflection of our heart. It should be a reflection. See, if we let foul things come out of our mouth, what do you think is residing in our heart? Foul things. Right? Because out of the mouth speaks the heart, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now Jesus said that if you will seek his kingdom and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. Now what things was Jesus referring to here in the scripture? He was talking about all the things that people worry about. And we're told about people, they, they worry the most about finances. Money. We talked about money last week. I'm not going to go back to that. But last week we did hear from Matthew 6, 19. It says, Don't, do not store up treasures on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So the second point we need to consider in here is, uh, you don't want everything you need, right? Huh? Yeah, same thing, same thing. Lori had that same look when I, when I said this yesterday. <laughs> See, but I never wanted one of the spankings that I ever got, but I needed every one of them that I did get. Okay? Now does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Look at him. Look at him laughing. <laughs> He's sitting there going, oh, yeah. yeah. I remember those. <laughs> I remember that belt. Oh boy, do I remember that belt. The third point we need to consider is God doesn't give us everything we want. And I for one am glad that He doesn't. You know, one of the greatest blessings of God is found in those things that He doesn't give us. For instance, God doesn't always give us what we deserve. And that's called grace. The last point we need to consider is God always gives us what we need. And there's a story about these two stores that were across the street from each other. They were highly competitive. And they were always trying to get ahead. And I always like to think of that old adage of keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing going on here. But they were very competitive. And the manager of one store came out one day and nailed this great big sign over the front of the store and he says, if you want it, 
we have it. Well, the manager of the store from across the street walked out. He looks over and he sees that sign. And he thought about it for a few minutes. He went back inside his store and a little while later he came out with a sign and he nailed that across the front of his store and it said, if we don't have it, you don't need it. <laughs> and I can tell you something right now, no matter what you think, no matter if you don't have it at this point in life, it's because God knows at this point in life, you don't need it. You don't need it. You see what the Lord was trying to teach us here is was this. It's our job to serve God, and it's his job to supply us in life. Our job is to serve God. His job is to supply us. But see, the problem is most people have it backwards. Most people think that it's our job to supply us, and it's God's job to serve us. And our idea of, of prayer is to bring this long laundry list of all this stuff, to God. Well, God, I want this today, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this, and I want this. We come with God with this huge laundry list of prayer, and our idea is that He should give us everything that we ask for. But see, that's not the way it works. Somehow, worship gets lost in that translation. The whole idea of prayer is to worship God. To bring honor and glory to God. It's exactly that attitude of us bringing that laundry list to God and saying, I want, I want, I want. And that whole attitude, see, that cuts us off from God and from having Him giving the blessings in our life for us to have a fulfilled life. Because it's not about all I want. It's not about our righteousness. It's about His. See, in a real sense, we've been called to live from hand to mouth, His hand to our mouth. We should wait for God to supply us with what we need. That's what the scripture tells us. We're to come to Him in prayer as a form of worship, not just ask Him to fulfill our wants, but to fulfill our needs instead. So instead of that laundry list of wants, we come to Him with our needs. And it says by prayer and supplication of these things are submitted with an earnest heart that He will give those things. He will answer those prayers for us. There's a couple conditions we've got to be in there. Right? Supplication. Humble ourselves before Him. Humble ourselves. Not come in there and say, God, I want this. You know, I need these things. We're to come to God with thanksgiving and prayer and to serve others as we do, lifting up the needs of others before our own. Before our own. We talk a lot about that here of going to prayer, care, share ministries. That's what we were founded on. Is to pray for others, to care for them. And to share the good news of God with them as we do. Lifting up the needs of others before our own. And I've got a poem here that speaks exactly to this that I want to read to you now. And this poem is from an anonymous author during the Civil War. And it really sums up, I think, what we need to learn. I asked for God the strength that I might achieve. I was made weak. I might humbly obey. I asked God for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches so that I might be happy. I was given poverty so that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness. That I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might have and enjoy in life. And I was given a life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for. 
Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I, amongst all men, are most richly blessed. That, I think, is probably you know, one of the most telling things I've ever read. And I read it three times yesterday, and I was just going, I don't think anything can be more true. See, what we think is going to fulfill our lives is all this stuff, all this stuff we want. But God gives us what we need. And we have to understand it and look at those things and understand that those needs are fulfilling our life. See, it's fulfilling that life that God has. So I ask again, do you want to make the rest of your life the best of your life? Will you allow Jesus Christ to be Lord? Put it first. Live every moment for him. And he will take care of the rest. Life ends. Eternity. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus. <coughs> Help us to remain steadfast in faith so we can be crowned in heaven. Lord, please help us to serve you at all times with undivided attention. Let us faithfully direct our praises and prayers towards you always. Help us to remain consistent with you throughout the days of our lives. Father God, keep our feet from falling and help us to hold firm to the teachings that have validation. Do not let us become complacent with your word, but help us to abide by your instruction so that we might prosper. Give us the gift of discernment of spirit so that we can hold firm to your truth always. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to be diligent and keep your testimony until the very end. And when the end comes, let us receive a warm welcome in heaven and let me partake in your holy day. In your holy name we pray today. Amen. Thank you, Mark. I don't know about y'all, but plenty to think about. As I was thinking about communion this morning and just praying about it, I was drawn to 1 Corinthians 10, which is not necessarily a, a, a chapter that you think about when you think about communion, but if we look at verses 10 through 17, it says this, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And um, I, I really want to break that song with this last sentence in this, in this passage. It says, and though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. You see, when we come together as one, as a church, whether we're here in person taking communion, or whether we're online sharing in communion with us, we are one body. In Proverbs, it tells us that iron sharpens iron, so when we come together, we are stronger than we are when we are apart. So whatever we've got going on in our lives, we can strengthen one another through each piece of that. And it's all because of what Christ did for us on the cross. Scripture says this, and this is what it is recorded that Jesus said, and, and they were eating, and, and Jesus took some bread, and he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples, and he said, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And then later in the meal, he took the cup, and after filling it, he said, each of you drink this. This is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive 
the sins of the planet. We're reminded as often as we do this, we are to do so until Jesus returns because he won't partake of his meal again until he returns to us. And we say this all the time, and I know I say it a lot. You know, we all think, Lord Jesus, come on, just let's let's get this over with it. Let's so we can come home to you. But Father, you have a greater plan. He gives us what we need. And right now, what this world needs is some Jesus in it. Oh, yeah. World needs Jesus. And I know there's a song in there too. But think about those things. Think about the things that, that Mark brought to us in the message today. Go back through the comments, catch some of those, those points that were uh, notated in the comments. Re listen to this sermon. Because the, tr the fact is, is life will end. Eternity where? It's because of the bread and the cup that we are saved. Father, bless this bread and this cup as we partake of this meal together. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you that we can come together as a body and be one. Thank you that you give your word to guide us through our days here and that you provide all that we need. And Father, as we prepare to end this portion of your service and, and go on to the prayers for the people, Father, we know there are prayers that won't be maybe said aloud. Father, we put them before you now. Father, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to that time in our service where we can share our praises and our concerns. And Denise, I'll have you come up. Okay. Thank you so much. started. I know there's people that need prayer. So, um, other than Bruce, and is there anybody else that would ask for prayer this morning? Okay, <laughs> I'll begin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have just had a struggle this last week and a half with Steve having surgery. And um, through it all, um, God was there. And, uh, I just want to share a little bit of that this morning. For he is still in control, no matter what. And when, um, the day after Steve's surgery, when they told him he could go home, and I could take care of him, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, I kind of lost it. I, you know, I was angry, I was sad, I was just, I was terrified. And I honestly didn't know what to do. But the nurse, and I told the nurse, and I kind of got angry with her, but she's like, you can do this. I'll show you how. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but um, so in all my despair, I called my mother-in-law. <laughs> and I feel kind of ashamed that I didn't pray for that first. But she reminded me that God is in control. And, um, and I know he is. He gave her this song to give to me. And it um, is It Is Well by Bethel Music. And I listened to that over and over and over and over again. And I knew God was with me. And through all the struggle this last week that we had, I knew God was there. And it's still hard. I'm still angry sometimes. I still have sadness, so to speak. He's, he's having a rough time. But he knows God's there too. And um, we are so thankful for all of your prayers. You are such great prayer warriors. 
And um, I couldn't get through this without you. So there's other songs too, like One Worry That You Had, Hold On To Me by Laura Daigle. I listened to that over and over and over. And one other song that um, God placed on my heart is called I'm Fully Known by Torrin Wells. And uh, praise God that he loves us for who we are. And, um, and for all the things that we go through in life. He's always there, no matter what. And I know in my heart that he loves us unconditionally, and he is always with us. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, you are a powerful, almighty God. You are the God that washes our sins away, our fears away, and all our anxieties. You are the King of kings, the Prince of peace. You are our God who loves us so much, that you died for us on the cross, and that you opened up a way that we can talk to you daily, and that you listen. Help us never to take that for granted, Father. <clears throat> for you are always there to hear our struggles, our sadness, and our worries. And today I just want to lift up Bruce. I, want, I would like you to wash him, Lord God. Wash the virus away that is causing him pain and anguish. And just comfort him today. And help him to know that you are with him. And that you will be there through all this. I would like you to watch over Steve and Larry. And just uh, wash over them, Lord God. And comfort their hearts. Give them hope for this future that they have. Oh, Lord, I, I pray um, that you will um, heal Terry's shoulder, Lord God. Give him comfort and strength each and every day and help him to uh, just know that you love him. No matter what pains we go through, you are always there. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on you, always. And help us not to lean on our own understanding but to talk to you daily, to read your word daily, and put you first in our lives. For you are the God who knows us completely. You formed us in our mother's wombs, Lord Jesus. You know who we are. You are with us in our coming and in our going out. You are always with us, and you will lead us back to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This ends our online portion of our service today, and I'm going to tell you how awesome our God is and how He meets our needs right in the middle of where we are as we live out our lives, because it wasn't probably two minutes into the sermon today and my headache disappeared, and it's gone. I mean, I've been fighting this. We came in, Terry turned the lights off and heard my eyes were five different shades of red. I couldn't stand it. I mean, I was physically sick. And I was hoping that I would get through the message. So God will meet our needs. He knows what they are. And he's an awesome God. He really is. So let's go to God in prayer as we end this message and receive this blessing today. Dear Lord, we thank you for answering prayer. We thank you for the opportunity to lift others up in prayer in your name. Lord, we come before you today and we confess that we are sinners and we are in need of your grace and mercy. We pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus, that we can and will be redeemed by the truth of your word, by the love in our hearts. Help us to keep you first in our lives and keep first things first as we go through each and every day. Lord, help direct our hearts as we start to stray from you and as we try and make ourselves first, as we try and put material things first, as we put the wants in our life first. Help us to focus on keeping you first in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us these messages and these instructions. 
on how to live a fulfilled life. Lord, you want us to be happy. You want us to prosper. And we thank you for the truth in the scriptures that you give us. Help us dust off our Bibles and read your truth and read your instructions so that we might live out our faith day to day. In your blessed and holy name we pray.